Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you for this day, Jesus. We thank you for health and strength and life. We thank you for all that you have provided, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hey, that song is like in King James language, half made. <laughs> I, I kept going back between half and half, you know. <laughs> I think I'm going to nix the half. <laughs> That's hard. You know, I'm glad I wasn't born in those days, should I say. You had to talk like that. Everybody try to watch a movie like that. I do like movies like that, but I can't understand what they're saying at the time. <laughs> My ears like strain, you know, to, to watch that. But anyway, I'm glad we have things like the NLT <laughs> that, that we can understand. How many of you love Jesus tonight? If you don't love Jesus and you're here tonight, I'm going to, you know, get your head examined. I hope that we all love the Jesus tonight. Worship members be saying, oh, how I love Jesus.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, how we love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace and your love toward us, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Praise your wonderful name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship members be saying, everybody will be happy over there. wonderful name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. The, one of the verses in that song says, and there'll be no more mourning in that land or any burdens for us to bear. Won't that be an awesome day? Hallelujah. But in the meantime, you can cast all your cares upon Jesus. God is able. Worship him as we sing that.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we can cast our cares upon you, Jesus, and that you're willing and able, Lord, to meet them, Jesus. We worship you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I thought that was a good segue into what we're just about to do. Cast all our cares upon him. You got cares tonight? Oh, yeah, we got cares. We got more cares than we care to mention. Uh, but God is able. He is able. Remember, Sister Bev? And, um, and I got to get my cheat sheet out here. Anybody have cheat sheets other than me? I got lots of cheat sheets, as a matter of fact. But remember Sister Bev and uh, Kitty and Sister Julie. She doing okay? Doing better? All right. I'm going to pray that that sugar gets equaled out. And all those needs that you just lifted, lift them again. Look around this room and let's form that web of agreement and take those needs to Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you, Lord. God, we ask that you would minister to every need lifted before you, Jesus. You know what they are, God. Touch Julie and Bev and Kitty, oh God, and work your miraculous power in their life, oh God. Restore them, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Touch Brother Keith tonight, oh God. And do your mighty work in him, Jesus. And open doors, Father, that no man can shut. Shut doors that no man can open, oh God. Bless our young people, God. Even this congregation tonight, God. Do your mighty work in the midst of us, Lord. God, we worship you, Lord. And we praise you, Jesus. And we believe you for each and every need, God. Have your way, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, in Jesus' name. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Get out of your pews and greet one another.
All righty. <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> where does the time go? <clears throat> this, this is the disobedient owl over here. We're going to move them back to the center's bench in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys believe it's time for the church picnic again? I tell you what, this year has flown past. And before you know it, we're going to be looking at Christmas. That's right, I'm going to keep talking until I get everybody's attention. <laughs> I'll just, ooh, gifts, Christmas, yeah. It'll be here before we know it. We'll be getting the coats out and snow. <laughs> Cast all your care. Right? But, um, Picnic, church picnic next Saturday, Brandywine Springs Park. Uh, be there, be square. It's going to be a lot of fun. Bring something delicious so I can eat it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and if you, um, there's going to be a, there's a no-bake dessert contest. Um, I know how to make some of those. <laughs> Jello. I, I promise you, if you bring Jello, it's not going to win. <laughs> Pudding, not going to win, right? So you're going to have to get fancy with it. So if you guys want to enter the no-bake dessert contest, just let... Hmm? Oh, we'll eat it all. Just won't win a prize, necessarily, right? But uh, let Sister Regina know if you're going to enter that contest and make sure you have your dessert next week. Uh, the church supplies all the paper goods and stuff, so just bring whatever food, side dish, whatever you want to bring. Um, also, we're getting up for... All that good stuff, exactly. Hey, that's the bee-free zone over there. You know, that area over there doesn't have all the bees and flies. I don't, I don't think they like the smoke. I can hang out over there. I don't like bugs and creatures and stuff, but anyway. But uh, that's next Saturday. Uh, what time is it against the... Oh, 12 o'clock if you just want to come and eat. If you want to grill, get there early. You can get there as early as 10 uh, if you like. Also, we're gearing up for Friends and Family Day. Man. Again, time flies, and um, there's lots of open slots on the sign-up sheet out there. And so if you would like to help, and uh, some, I, I think, yes, you gonna help? Oh, well, put your name on this. You can go right now. <laughs> she's raising her hand and she's cool like, ooh, ooh, me, right? <laughs> I wanna help. That's, that's how it always starts. It's like kids, you know, they like to play in washing dishes until they have to wash the dishes. Then they're like crying about it. But anyway, we do need your help. So be sure to sign up out there or else you're going to get drafted. Mm -hmm. It's always best to do things willingly. Right, yeah, yeah. The, see, he, Stephen's got his, he's making his pen motion. As if to say, you can get penciled in. And you might get a sign that... <laughs> going to get the scribble, whatever you call that thing. Yeah. Uh, be sure to sign yourself up because you might get the job that you hate. And there's no reneging once you get on that sheet. It's permanent, as he says. All right. All righty. Um, Ministry Monday. Again, this Monday. I think we have three more sessions. Right? Three more on the month of August. So make yourself available for that. And um, it is time to wait upon you for your offering. If you'll stand. And do I have any ushers? Ushers tonight. <laughs> which is <laughs> Amy's birthday. That's right. 
<laughs> Happy birthday, Amy. Uh, I'm already running low on voice, so I'll save the song for home. <laughs> Absolutely. Can't remember, leave off those big landmarks. I won't tell you how old she is. She might. I don't know if she's one of those people. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> the big three. Oh, yes. <laughs> I can tell you that things start changing at 30. Oh, yeah. Uh, take the offering. I can't talk about how the fat catches up with you at 30. I can't talk about that. <laughs> you know, you guys know I was skinny as a rail when I first started coming to this church. Like, you could probably count my veins. Like, I was a pole. But when 30 came, I'm like, where did all this come from? <laughs> Things changed. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's switch it back to this offering here. <laughs> he gets on the... We're not going to talk about what happens at 40, 50. <laughs> uh, stick around. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's ask the Lord to bless this offering, and you guys stand in March. Oh, March. Jesus in your name. God, we ask that you would bless this offering, Father. May it be used for the uplifting of your kingdom. Bless both the giver and the receiver in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. You may be seated. If you are grilling at the, at the picnic, you do need to bring your own tinfoil as well as charcoal. Um, now, there may be charcoal that somebody else brings as well, but as you grill, you'll use it up. So uh, just to be safe, if you do plan to grill, bring your own charcoal because I do not plan to be the burnt sacrifice. I would like to eat the burnt sacrifice. I see Sister Iris decided to go subdued tonight. What happened? Where's my hot pink dress? I love Sister Iris for letting me be so ornery. I know you do. I love you back. Amen. Well, now I don't know what to do. My wife looked at me right before I came to the pulpit and said, Ooh, tonight's going to be good. You're in a funny mood. I didn't know I was in a funny mood. So now I'm not sure what to do. I guess I'll preach what I felt to preach anyway. We'll see how it comes out. I want to turn your attention back to Luke chapter 9 again. I read it to you this morning. And uh, specifically verse 10 through 17. Let me read it to you from a different vantage point. I mentioned it this morning, but I want to mention it again. Um, as new folks are continuing to come, help us with the greeter's desk by not congregating there. As you come in in service, um, past the greeter's desk in the vestibule is fine, into the sanctuary, but don't congregate around the greeter's desk um, both because of being able to allow our guests to have free access to that space so that we can invite them and engage them, but then also so that you're not being a distraction to the greeters who have a, a very important role, and I appreciate everybody who, whether they're on the door or at the desk, um, they're very, very crucial. Every single person that's there is carrying out a very crucial role in our ability to reach out to people. I know that I enjoy wigging people out a little bit by greeting them by name and they have never seen me before but also they don't miss the fact that they come to this church and immediately as long as they are willing to share whatever information they share with us whether it's simply their name or their address their telephone their email that we are responsive to them so to all of you that help us do that thank you and to the rest of the congregation Thank you for respecting that space and working with us as we endeavor that. Um, coming up fairly soon also will be Sunday mornings will be dedicated. There will be an invite to any of our first-time visitors to join me in um, our reception room. Um, and we're going to be reaching out to them. And so I encourage you to respect that space as well and understand, as I've mentioned to you over the last several months, that on Sunday morning, um, if you want to speak with me, you're going to have to wait until after that. And better would be to schedule it or put it into Sunday night um, because my focus is going to be on those new folks, trying to connect with them and draw them in, make sure that they feel welcomed. And uh, please let me proactively, uh, if you didn't eat breakfast that morning, that reception is not for you to come get your lunch. Okay because the focus is on connecting with those new folks and I don't want them seeing me smack your fingers because you're in there grabbing food <laughs> they'll think this isn't the kind of church I want to come to but I will smack your fingers And on that note, Jamie leaves. As I already said, behave yourselves and do not come in there. No, I didn't say I was happy. My wife said I was in a funny mood. I don't even know what that means. 
but you'll be seeing that happen. And if you see any first-time visitors or you bring a first-time visitor, um, try to, we're going to be working to try to usher them into there uh, without feeling like they're being pressured. But at the same time, gaining access to them, let them talk with me and my wife and, and connect with us a little bit. And so help us with that, if you will. And uh, again, everything is about serving that new person so that they will be able to come again and hear the gospel. That's the bottom line. That's why we exist. That's what Sunday morning, Sunday morning is about. It is about giving people access because we hold a treasure in this place. We hold a treasure. And there are a lot of people that are looking for it. They're looking for it. And we want to optimize the ability for them to find it. And uh, there's commitment that they have to make. They have to want it. But at the same time, we want to optimize the ability for them to find it. And so work with us in that. All right. Looking at Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 10. And again, if you were here this morning, you've heard this. But let me read it to you again uh, just to refresh your memory and, uh, and draw your attention to a particular element within it tonight. When the apostles returned, they had been sent forth. They told Jesus everything they had done. Then he slipped quietly away with them toward the town of Bethsaida. But the crowds found out where he was going, and they followed him. He welcomed them and taught them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who were sick. Late in the afternoon, the twelve disciples came to him and said, I want you to pay close attention to what they said. Okay, tonight I want you to look not so much upon Jesus' response and his miracles, but I want you to look at the disciples. There was a need in front of them. What did they say? First statement they said was, send the crowds away to the nearby villages and farms so they can find food and lodging for the night. There is nothing to eat here in this remote place. So I want you to notice that the first response on the part of the disciples was to say, send them away. Jesus said, you feed them. I'm going to come back to that statement. I already alluded to that this morning. You feed them. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Or, here's the second response of their, on their part, or are you expecting us? to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd. For there were about 5,000 men there. Jesus replied, tell them to sit down in groups of about 50 each. So the people all sat down. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, I want you to understand, and you all are conversant enough in this to know, that the Gospels have an agenda about how they tell their story. They pick how they tell the story. So, the exact chronology, I would have to go into a very labored discussion of the synoptic picture and laying all of the Gospels next to one another and try to create some semblance of a sequence. So I'm just, to all of you that already know about this, I'm acknowledging that what I'm about to say has this caveat in it. But just one chapter before, according to Gospel of Luke, the narrative of Luke, these same disciples have seen Jesus do the following. After telling a parable about the sower and a parable about the lamp, he gets into a boat and he calms the sea. So they have seen him within the near recent past. Speak to wind and waves and they go calm. Okay? They've seen him Free a man who was possessed with a legion of demons. They have seen him go through a crowd. And in that crowd, heal a woman with an issue of blood. 
and then proceed to the ruler of the synagogue's house and raise his daughter from the dead. Does everybody get the picture? They have just had a tour de force on the power and the ability of Jesus. Furthermore, they have just returned from having been sent out in his name with the power and authority to cast out demons and to heal all diseases. And as I read to you in verse 10, when they returned, they told him all of the things they had been able to do because of that authority of his name. And yet when faced with a need, they totally missed the correct response. Their first response was to say, this isn't our responsibility. And to say to Jesus, send them away so they can take care of themselves. They followed you out into this wilderness. They came to this place on their own. And now the day has grown long and there's no food here. There are no vendors. There's no town nearby. You need to send them away so that they can get to a town. They can get to a village. They can get to a place where they can purchase food before they lose their strength and before it becomes dark and before there's no longer access. Send them away. There's nothing to eat here. They need to be sent someplace else to fill their need. And what catches my attention, and I mentioned it to you, alluded to, to it this morning, is Jesus' first response. Luke preserves this very uniquely. In Jesus' response to them and says, you feed them. I wonder tonight how much we are walking around the world running into people with needs and we've got various responses to the need and Jesus is looking at us and saying you feed them. Now you can take this passage and you can assume then that it is completely our responsibility to meet the needs of the world. And I'm here tonight to tell you that if you take that tack, in about 30 years you will be dead. Because the needs of the world are greater than your capacity. I don't care how creative you are. I don't care how many people you get on board your team. I don't care what absolutely innovative idea you employ. The needs of the world are greater than our capacity. And the reason is, is because the needs of the world are constantly being generated by a problem called sin. See, we're really not making much headway. That's why politicians are so frustrated. That's why governments and social agencies are so frustrated because they are swimming upstream and they really aren't making much progress because they are trying to take care of problems that are constantly being generated and multiplied and intensified by something that is not being addressed, namely the condition of sin. We humans are our own worst enemies. We destroy ourselves by the sin that is within us. So if you think that what Jesus is saying when he says you feed them is that the human beings there can on their own take care of this, you've missed the point. That is not what he's saying. But at the same time, he is telling them, no, don't send them away. Point number one to you tonight is to understand that this place is not a place to send the needy away. If you want a place where hungry people aren't present, you need to find another church. If you want a place that is geared for feeding those who have plenty. See, let me tell you something about a hungry person. A hungry person doesn't care what you flop in front of them. They'll eat it. A hungry person will eat anything placed in front of them. They're hungry. 
When you are filled, that's when you turn your nose up. That's when you say, I want my meat cooked this way. Because you can afford to go without a meal. You can afford to say, I'll go elsewhere. You can afford to say, I won't eat this. You can afford to say, I don't like this. But when you're hungry, you don't get that way. You're hungry. And hungry people are who we want here. People that are spiritually hungry for God. Now here's the problem. When you serve Jesus, he begins to feed you. That does not mean you have to lose your hunger. You've got to pursue him. You've got to continue to pant after him. You have to continue to seek after him. Hungry people don't care about niceties. They're hungry. Hungry people don't care about decorum. They're hungry. Hungry people don't care what kind of table you set. They're hungry. Hungry people are not focused on whether you put the napkin on the correct side or whether it's folded to look like a swan or whether the knife goes with the fork or the spoon, which right now I can't remember which it is. Yeah, I do remember which it is now. It doesn't matter. Hungry people don't even care if you give them utensils. Now, I'm speaking a parable because I'm not talking about feeding literal food, but I am talking about the spiritually hungry. Spiritually hungry people cause messes because they do not know where their next meal is coming from. They need so badly. And Jesus said to his disciples, in the midst of a physical hunger of food, you feed them. The disciples' first response was to send them away and make them responsible for feeding themselves. Jesus says, you feed them. You feed them. We have a responsibility, church, to care for the hungry. Whether they take your seat, whether they park in your parking spot, whether they disturb your access to the pastor, whether they smell good, speak like you speak, or are weird, different, immodest, unholy, ungodly. This is a place for hungry people. We're not sending them away. But what's, incredi what's incredible to me about this story is that Jesus said, you feed them. And so the disciples response to a huge task. Remember I told you this morning, 20, 25, maybe 30,000 people are there and Jesus, the master, has just told them, feed them. So their response is to turn, instead of saying, you send them away so that they can go take care of themselves, now they turn to their own resources. And of course, as soon as they did that, they came up with an incredible question. Master, we've only got, between all of us, five loaves and two fish. We have a snack for the 12 of us. You aren't seriously asking me. You aren't expecting me to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd. You don't expect us to take care of this. Now, I want to remind you that in the near recent past, they have seen this Jesus calm a storm. They have seen this Jesus send them forth with the authority to cast out demons and to heal. They have seen this Jesus just by a woman touching the hem of his garment, her issue of blood is healed. They've seen this Jesus walk in to Jairus' house and speak back to life a dead little girl. They have seen this Jesus walk up to a man that they have chained and cannot hold because of the power of the demonic forces in his naked body. And they have seen that man cower 
before the power of Jesus and be turned to his right mind. And the best they can come up with when faced with a hungry crowd, with a need that is insurmountable, is they looked at what they had and said, you want us to spend our money to try to buy some more of this to feed them? Now, my sermon tonight is very simple, but it is very profound. Why did they not hear the command of Jesus, you feed them, as permission to do something with him? Why did they not, instead of saying, go away, and instead of looking at their own resources and saying, we can't do this, why didn't they turn to the man who spoke to the wind and the waves? Why didn't they turn to the man who spoke to death? Why didn't they turn to the man who spoke to demons? And say, how about you take what we have and do something with it? Somebody here tonight, you got five loaves and two fish. Why aren't you turning to the man who speaks to wind and waves? Why aren't you turning to the man who speaks to demons? Why aren't you turning to the man who speaks to death? Why aren't you turning to the man whose virtue is so powerful that it even flows through material cloth, through a woman's fingertips brushing the edge of that cloth? Why aren't you turning to him and saying, Lord, I don't have much, but I know you've commanded me to feed them. So do your work with what I have. I don't plan to preach long tonight. Because some of you are sitting on these pews waiting for God to move. And God is waiting on you to move. You don't have much. You're exactly right. I've already told you, if you're going to come to this church, you're not going to send them away. See, that's one way to handle the burden, is send them away. That way they're out of sight, they're out of mind, and you don't have to worry about it. I'm glad this church every Sunday morning is filled. I'm glad there's people here tonight that I know want the Holy Ghost, and I don't know how to get the Holy Ghost for them, and I'm burdened by it every time. I'm glad there's hungry people here. We're not going to send them away. We're not going to be complacent. The other side of it is, is to simply say, hey, God, I don't have what it takes. What you're asking me to do is beyond my ability. And you're right. It is. But everybody has five loaves and two fish. Remember, I speak in parables here. I use an image for you to understand. Everybody has their snack. You do have something. That something won't be enough. But that something in the hands of Jesus is more than enough for you to feed them. Jesus obviously within this story instructed them and and took control of the situation, told them to set them down and said, give me the five loaves and the two fish. Tonight, I'm here to tell the church that God is waiting on you.
say, but I don't, I don't have what it takes. I know. That's right. I agree. Well, I'm working to get to where I have what it takes. No, you, you, you can't save up enough five loaves and two fish snacks to get to 30,000. The needs of this city, the needs of this county, the needs of metropolitan Philadelphia, we will never save enough to get there. We will never get to the right time that we're ready. But Jesus had just spoken to the wind and the waves and had gone silent at his voice. He had just healed a woman who had gone from doctor to doctor, not even intentionally, just by walking by. He had just spoken to a young girl who lay dead in her parents' house and told her to arise. He had just stepped to the shores where a wild man came running and spoke with authority and told him to be silent and cast the demon out. So when you're walking through your life tomorrow, and you run into the person who's hungry. And you hear the voice of Jesus say, feed them. Are you going to send them away because it's their own responsibility? Or are you going to say to him, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I've only got five loaves and two fish. Or third... Are you going to turn to the one who has performed in your own life spectacularly and say, hey, God, I got this. Could you multiply it? Hey, God, I've got this. Could you use it? Hey, God, I got this. It don't seem like much. But you're the guy who speaks to winds and waves. You're the guy who brushes a woman's hand and heals her. You're the God who speaks to demons, thousands of them. And they ask respectfully, can we go into the pigs? You're the one who spoke to death and told it to back away from that girl. How about me, God? Give me the words. Give me the action. Lead me. Guide me. Let me feed them. You see, what you feel in this place right now is not something I've conjured up. It's not a result of my preaching. It's a result of the Spirit of God who's come to this place with three simple words. You feed them. He's not telling you to go get strong enough or rich enough or equipped enough. He's telling you you can do all things through him who strengthens you. Why aren't you calling on him? Why aren't you reaching for him? Why aren't you realizing his power his ability, but he's going to work through you. Do you realize that, again, in using this parable, if you will, or analogy, do you realize that not a single piece of bread, not a single piece of fish made it to the hungry from Jesus' hands? It went through the disciples. Every group that got any food and we know from the scriptures that they got more than enough. They ate all as much as they wanted and there was left over. It got to their mouths. It got to their hands. It got to those group of 50. Not through Jesus' hands. Jesus didn't do it. The disciples did it. Yet every basket they carried with bread and fish, they carried what they knew was not their own product. 
they carried a basket full of food that was going to nourish the hungry. And they knew they hadn't produced it. They knew they'd only had five loaves and two fish. But the hand of the master that I don't even know if the crowd ever saw what he was doing because he was probably behind the wall of those disciples. But there just kept coming forth basket after basket after basket of bread and fish. And it was all because the disciples finally started doing what they could have done on their own in the first place. Turn to the one who speaks to demons. Turn to the one who speaks to the wind and the waves. Turn to the one who controls death. Turn to the one who heals without even being asked to heal. Turn to the one who's given us that same authority and say, Jesus, I got five loaves and two fish. Let me feed them. I find myself personally in an interesting place in these days. I find myself due to my calling and where God has placed me in the kingdom where I am acutely aware the same way the disciples were with the 20 to 30,000 people I find myself completely overwhelmed by all that I've been asked to do. And the only way that I'm making it through each day is that I am acutely aware that there is a man named Jesus who speaks to the wind and the waves and it obeys. He speaks to demons and they are silenced. He speaks to death, and it is sent back to hell. He speaks to sickness, and it's removed. And he wants to give me that same authority and let me do the impossible, the absolute impossible because of him. I know what it feels like to be overwhelmed. I know what it feels like to not be up to the task. I know what it feels like to not have what it takes. I know what it feels like to come behind somebody who from your vantage point, it looks like they had what it took. You just don't in comparison to them. I know all of that. And tonight God is calling you on the line and saying, what is your excuse? Why are you not feeding them? when you have me. This is not meant to condemn you tonight, but it is meant to, as the scripture uses the term, chasten you. Life is moving along. Now understand something. I am not someone that is in a panic, for I know that the God who I serve knows when he's coming. I'm not in a panic. But there's also a fine line between doing what God has asked you to do in preparation and using preparation as the excuse for either sending them away, you're not ready, or saying to God, God, you've got to find somebody else because I'm not ready. Really? How ready do you need to be? How prepared do you need to be? How much do you need to understand? How much bread and fish do you need to have in order for Jesus, through you, to feed them? How many verses do you need to be able to quote? How much discipleship do you need to have? How many Bible studies do you need to have sat through? How many Sunday nights do you need to have been immersed in?
How many? I'm here tonight to tell you that somebody, at least one person in this place, and I have a sneaky suspicion it's a few more than one. God's looking at you and saying, you're copping out. Now, the good news for you is God is patient, but there are still 20 to 30,000 people that need food. They're hungry. God is patient, but it's not you waiting on God. It's God waiting on you. You don't need any more. Will you learn more? Did the disciples learn more after this experience? Absolutely. You will learn till the day you die if you walk with Jesus. But right now, the message is pretty simple. You just need to go. And I'm with you. He made a promise, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He said, I promise you, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. You've got the guy who speaks to demons. You've got the guy who speaks to the wind and the wave. You've got the guy who, just the hem of his garment, healed a woman with an issue of blood that she had gone to doctors for years and years and couldn't solve it. You've got the guy who walks in and raises a little girl from the dead. He's in you. Not with you. In you. You're never separated from him. You're overwhelmed, but he's not. You're undone, but he's not. You're inadequate, but he's not. You don't know what to do, but he does. You don't have the words to speak, but he does. You don't have the power, but he does. You can't make five loaves and two fish into a smorgasbord to feed 20 to 30,000 people, but he can. But when he breaks the bread and he breaks the fish, it does not get from him to them unless it goes through us. Hence his command. You feed them. You feed them. This is not meant to send you home in condemnation. It's actually meant to set you free. But you're going to have to, just like my little girl, is going to have to navigate that relationship with Jesus where she gives up the control in order for him to then take over her tongue and her lips and her to speak in other tongues as God gives her the utterance. You're going to have to give up control of your life. Some of you are saying, well, I want a different kind of job so I can do it. Yeah, but you haven't given up control. You've got goals that you have set. You've got ideas that are fixed, and God goes, well, no, you've you got to trust me with this. You've got to rely totally on me. Can you imagine the disciples? Imagine with me for just a moment when they finally see him breaking this bread. They're breaking this bread, this breaking this bread. And we think, oh, once they see the first breaking of the bread and the first breaking of the fish, oh, they're good to go. No, no, no. These are the guys that saw him speak to wind and waves. Still didn't turn to him. These are guys that just saw him speak to demons, thousands of demons, and bring them under control and cast them out. These are guys that just saw him speak to death. Once you start feeding 20 to 30,000 people, you better not run out. Once you start passing that bread out, once you start passing that fish out, you better not run out or you're in trouble. It took faith on their part to go and take that first basket and walk out there and hand it to a group of 50. 
because there are hundreds of more groups of 50 sitting there going, hey, us next. And they don't know for sure. I mean, all they, he filled one basket, but can he fill a second? He filled a second, well, can he fill a third? He filled a third, can he fill a fourth? You say, well, they, no, once you see the one, no, no, no. This, they already saw him cast out demons. How can you see Jesus speak to a man filled with a legion of demons and not go, man, he can do anything? How can you see? How can I see what Jesus has done in our lives and not think Jesus can do anything? Yet here we sit tonight and we struggle with it, don't we? I'm not here condemning you, but I am here speaking from God to your heart. Saying, no, you, you, you've got to give up control. You're not going to manage this thing. You're not going to control this thing. Put them in groups of 50. Give me the five loaves and the two fish. What we don't get in the story is when Jesus says, all right, take that basket and go. Well, Lord, I actually, did they, can we have a little more? No, take that one. Well, what are you doing, God, while we're gone? Take the basket and go. No, no, Lord, why don't we, why don't we go hide behind this, these trees over here and you, you show us the whole meal. And once I'm for sure that we can feed the 20,000, then I'll start passing it out. No, you, you start with where you're at right now. How about that basket there? Take it to them. But now, now Lord, see, you, you need to understand something. Some of you are waiting for God to lay the whole plan out. You don't get the whole plan. Some of you are waiting for God to jump through a hoop, and then you'll have faith. Can I break news to you? No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. It's you take a step of faith, and then Jesus starts breaking bread and breaking fish. Without faith, you can't please God. I'm not here to condemn you good folks. You're faithful. You're here. You're here on Sunday night. But I am here to feed you. Some of you, you may not even realize it, have been saying, God, I don't want to send them away, but, but God, I only got five loaves and I only got two fish. And must mean somebody else when, when you said you feed them. Because I don't have what it takes. I don't even know how to pray. I, I, I don't know how to preach. I, I don't know how to witness. I don't, I, I don't know enough scriptures. I don't... I don't, I, I don't know how to speak. I, I don't, I can't even put words together. Lord, I don't even, I, I, I don't have those skills. I don't, no. That which you've heard in many different contexts has smote you straight in the heart. You feed them. It was God. He's not going to give you that new job until you're willing to lose the one you have. And he knows your heart. He's not going to open that door before you until you walk through the one that he's already opened for you. But I, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. I know. I, I don't know how it's going to work either. Well, preacher, you got it all together. You got security. You got it all. You, you know, you're, you're, you're set. No, no, it's just a different place on the spiral. It's just a different spot. And Jesus has been drawing the kingdom to him, the people, the hungry ones. He's looking at us. Ragtag bunch of motley crew, us. He's saying, you feed them. He 
The answer is not trying to figure out how we're going to do it. The answer is to turn to the master, the one who speaks to the wind and the waves, the one whose hem, just his hem, was enough to heal a woman's lifetime condition, the one who speaks with authority to the demons and gave you the same authority. one who walks into a room filled with grief and sorrow and when he walks out there's nothing but joy because he commanded death where to go that Jesus is in you so when he says to you feed them why wouldn't you ask him to help and with Jesus help you can do anything anything as long as he's going there you can do it we sit tonight because of a couple Ask Jesus to help them start a church. Lots of trips to groups of 50. Lots of baskets to carry. Lots of leftovers to pick up. Don't get me wrong, you're going to work. You're going to work real hard. But at the end of the day, the only reason you'll ever feed them It's because you partnered with Jesus who's taken what little itty bitty nothing you have and he starts multiplying it. Taking what is insignificant and turning it into more than enough. Because at the end of the day because of a partnership between Jesus and the disciples there are five loaves and two fish had fed 20 to 30,000 people. So what are you waiting on? Because I can tell you God's waiting on you. I'm done. Would you come and pray? Hallelujah, Jesus. I give all myself to you. Here I am. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I let your spirit. Here I am.
You can use anything more you can use me. If you can use anything more you can use me. Take my hands, take my feet, touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. If you can use anything more you can use. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. 
If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Anything we can do to expedite getting the food from one place to another? Making sure we've got strong baskets. That we're being as efficient as possible moving from Jesus to the others. We'll do all those things. But at the end of the day, we exist in a very simple economy. Jesus breaking us delivering that's it just giving the people that are hungry what he has given us you don't have to have any more than what he gives you That's it. So what's he giving you? And what are you doing with it? I could preach a whole other sermon I won't tonight, even though I was short enough and maybe I could have fit it in. About the master who gave out the talents. You're not supposed to figure out what you're supposed to do with five if he gave you three. You're not supposed to figure out what you're supposed to do with three if he gave you one. Take what he gave you, take what's in your hand, and be faithful over it. The reason the guy that got five got ten, the reason the guy that got three got six, is because he was faithful over what God gave him in the first place. So what's in your hand? Well, the preacher won't. No, it's not about the preacher. Well, my neighbors, no, it's not about your neighbors. Well, my parents, it's not about your parents. Well, my spouse, it's not about your spouse. What do he give you? What's in your hand? Go give it to them. From what I understand, that's... Uh, That's been a core thing of what you've been hearing on Ministry Mondays. Get moving on what's right in front of you and in your hand. Because <laughs> he gives you more when you're faithful over little. So where are you at? You feed them. Great things will happen when we do it. Great things are happening as we are doing it. Join in on the fun. Join in on the fun. Praise God. Lift your hands and your voices if you would tonight and thank him for his word. 
Jesus, I love you tonight. Thank you for the sustenance and the guidance and the chastening and the direction, oh God, of your word. God, I believe in this congregation. I believe in these people, Lord, and I know that you do too. Empower us, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Empower us, almighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Give us, Lord, the confidence to walk with you, to do what you've asked of us, Lord. Oh, it's a blessed life to serve the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's a blessed life to serve the king. Thank you for the opportunity to be your servant, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be your servant. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you haven't signed up yet to help us out with Friends and Family Day, please do so. Um, I really don't want to have to fill in as many lines as there are empty out there, so help me out so my pen doesn't have to work as hard. supposed to laugh at me dad everybody knows what I'm doing it's all right sign up help us out and go have a great week being a light unto the world you're dismissed in Jesus name <laughs>